Hi all, thanks for joining us today for a, a little bit later of a start time. We're getting ready to get going here with Tucker's Tucker Kimball's presentation. Um, I'm Madeline Riley, I'm the community manager over at Ed Social Media. I'll be moderating today's event. Um, if you've joined us in the past, you're probably familiar with our hashtag that we like to use um, during these webinar sessions, which is hashtag Ed Social Media. So feel free to use that. Um, throughout the, the course of the event today for either questions, comments, um, and then you can also use your question interface on uh, the GoToMeeting control panel. Um, because today's format is fast, uh, we're going to try and queue up questions in the question panel on the right if they come up, and then we'll get to them all at the end so that way Tucker can breeze through his slides and then we'll have a good Q&A at the very end of the session. Um, obviously, if anything's very urgent, just let us know and we'll try and get to it as quickly as we can. Um, for this presentation, we're really excited. We're turning what we've done over at um, the Case NACE conference back in January, and we're bringing it on to a webinar series. So this is just the first of six that we'll be offering in the next few weeks. Um, and Tucker, thankfully, is going to kick it off for us because we trust him very much. He's one of our leading contributors and has done a great job for us um, through the past. And so um, if you're not familiar with Tucker, he's the director of communications over at Gould Academy. You can tweet at him today as well, which is at Tucker Kimball. I'll drop those into tweets here in just a second. But um, he oversees development and admissions, public relations and marketing for Gould. So he joined Gould in 2007. Um, after managing communications at the Maine Technology Institute. Um, so he has a lot of experience both in PR, communications, and definitely the web and social media. So we're really excited to hear from him today. So without further ado, Tucker, good luck, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Great. Well, thanks, Maddie. I really appreciate it. And um, well, uh, thanks to at Social Media as well for, for the opportunity. Um, and thank you to the attendees who are joining us this afternoon. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about blogging and building blog amb ambassador, <clears throat> excuse me, programs at at uh, uh, private independent schools, uh, and also in higher education. But really, it could it could also move across nonprofits or really for profit any organization. Um, I had the pleasure of, of talking about this at the Case Nace conference and um, had some great questions at the end. So I really look forward to folks' questions uh, at the end. And, and as Maddie said, I'll try to breeze through quickly. Um, and efficiently to make time for that. Uh, so moving forward, next slide. What to expect out of this? So for the next half hour, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, context and why blogging is the new normal uh, in terms of marketing, communications, and public relations. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that for folks who are in a position where they need to do a little educating uh, to maybe move things forward in their in their PR communication shops. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'll give you some some techniques and tips and things to talk about to uh, to take the folks to to help them uh, help you educate folks as you try to move things forward. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about the Gould Academy blog, which was our first student and faculty blog that's still going strong, and some of the lessons we learned uh, implementing that, and lessons that we continue to learn as we as we move forward with it. And I'll then talk a little bit about a case for building a brand uh, ambassadorship program and, and what I mean by that um, and, and how our, our faculty and staff, uh, excuse me, our, our student and faculty blog, the blog really sort of paved the way for building out more and more blogging uh, for the organization. And then I'll, lastly, I'll talk a little bit about where we are now with search and content marketing uh, next steps at Gould Academy because um, what I found about, out about blogging over the last five or six years at Gould uh, is that it can really sort of raise uh, all ships in the tide over a number of different uh, different areas um, as you get moving. So first, uh, a little bit about this guy, uh, Clay Shirky. This is someone I always come back to when I'm thinking about blogging, when I'm talking to folks about blogging. Um, and it, he's a pretty he's a pretty bright guy, uh, NYU professor, associate professor of inter interactive telecommunications distinguished writer in residence in the journalism de uh, department and fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet Society at, at Harvard. You know, the list goes on. Um, he's, a, he's a pretty sharp guy, and, and he talks a lot about uh, the uh, sort of um, media landscape that we now live in, thanks to not just the Internet, but sort of the social web. Um, 
and he's a guy I always point to uh, when talking with our board of trustees or, or talking with uh, uh, senior leadership uh, and our head of school over the last few years about why we're moving the way we're moving at Gould in terms of communications and using the web and using blogs and using the social web. Um, so I want to give this uh, give this out a little bit to folks who are who are looking for uh, some of those talking points when they when they're when they're working with folks. So he talks about uh, the 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 time that we live in. The, the our historical generation, he says, is the largest increase in expressive capability in human history. And it's really important, I think, when talking about this stuff and trying to build the program that you give folks who who are having a hard time sort of understanding or wrapping their heads around it because it is different. Um, and it has changed for, for everyone in the public relations industry, um, but for folks who are maybe outside that industry, it's a, it's a tough thing to wrap your head around. Uh, and he does a great uh, job of, of taking you through that. So what you can see in the top left corner in, you know, at, in the late 14th century was the, the printing press, um, and he talks about how media has changed throughout the years, and there, and there are different points of sort of a revolution in media, and it starts with the printing press, and then the the bottom left moves into moving forward. It moves into the telegraph and and, and the telephone uh, as another uh, form of media and, and getting message out. Um, moving to the bottom right, he talks about uh, film and um, and recorded media and and, and music uh, as another way of getting message out to a large group. And then most recently, in the last 100 years, in the top right, radio, television. And then what, it, what has happened over the last uh, decade or so is all of those things have merged onto the web, which is that giant smear in the center of your screen. Um, and so what he talks about is how, the, how media has, has natively moved onto the web, and all of these things live next door to each other. So what has happened, in a sense, is that no longer does one person or one entity control message, push it out through those blurred out channels that you see surrounding the bright spot, but is in fact sort of shared amongst everyone. Um, and now because of the ubiquitous nature of phones and laptops, uh, anyone who was receiving a message at one point can now produce that message as well. He uses a great example of, you know, a telephone, uh, you know, if it has the, if you push the right buttons, it becomes a radio, and it's as if when you buy a book, they threw the printing press in for free. This is the change that we are living through, and this is the change that communications shops, uh, marketing shops, are working within right now. And many have moved quickly through it and have embraced it. Others are still moving through it, and others might still be catching up to some extent. But this is the sort of the media landscape that we all share. And that's an important context, I think, for folks to hear. And in the bottom right, you'll see Clay Shirky, Ted, and I know that this presentation will be uh, made available to you. Um, and I highly recommend uh, watching the, the TED talk that he gives about this. Um, it can be pretty impactful when, when talking with, with folks. And so to move on through to his last, <clears throat> excuse me, question of the talk, as he, as he mentions, you know, the question we face isn't, is this the media environment we want to operate in? Because it's not a question of that. It's the environment that we've got now. And in fact, the question that we all face is how do we make the best use of this medium, even though it means changing the way we've always done things. And I think that that's where folks sometimes get bumped up a little bit. Ooh, this is a big change. We've never worked this way before. Um, but it's an exciting time, and uh, taking advantage of blogs and the social web can have a can have a real impact on uh, admissions, public relations, and development in your at your schools. So that's the context. So why is this important? Blogging is public relations and it's marketing. Um, what it has in fact done is it has taken the journalists out of the equation to some extent. Um, in PR shops and in, in, in my career in public relations, you, you would, you, and you still do, you always uh, uh, develop strong relationships with, with journalists and you, have, and, and you pitch stories through those relationships. Hey, I've got a great idea for a story. I think you'd really like it. Uh, what do you think about this? Now with blogs and, and the social web, um, you no longer have to pitch anyone. You can write that story yourself. Um, and you can build your own channels for distributing that story. Um, and I think that the, the folks that are doing it well, uh, a number of organizations and companies who are doing it well, well are seeing a real 
um, impact on their bottom line. Um, and there are some things that we've seen on our end here at Gould um, that I'll show you where, where we've seen an impact as well because telling those stories in a meaningful, meaningful way on the web and distributing them well will, will lead to marketing and will lead to potentially new students coming in through your admissions funnel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward too. Next up is its professional development. Um, for communications professional, professionals and, and public relations professionals, um, it's learning to use this stuff is professional development and um, I think that's really important. Um, the other part of it is for faculty, it's professional development. For folks, uh, for teachers, for coaches, uh, learning to blog, learning to use this stuff um, it allows them to develop their resumes and, and, and CVs. So for them, their development as a professional as well. Uh, so it's a win-win and, and it's PR marketing, it's professional development and moving forward it's good modeling. Um, as I move forward through the presentation you can make an argument that by, by creating these blogs and by doing this you're going to hit on all cylinders on all three of these things. So it's not just about PR and marketing in the conversation of why you should do this but it's also about professional development and it's also about good modeling for students. And so I'm going to, if, if Maddie will uh, humor me, I'm going to go into a little bit of my, my good modeling uh, soapbox about using the web for kids. Um, Beloit uh, College is an interesting school. Um, uh, back in 98, they created this list, which is really, really funny. And if you have a, have a moment, you, uh, definitely check it out. Um, their VP for PR and a humanities professor got together and they, came, they decided to, to produce this list on cultural references to help professors at the school when they were, uh, when they were lecturing to their, their audiences to make sure they were using cultural references that their students would understand. Um, so they created a list to, to give out to professors to understand sort of where the entering college class that, that year is coming. Um, and they've done it since 98. So this year's entering college class of 2016, which is of course our uh, graduating class at private boarding schools of last year, uh, they were born into cyberspace and they've therefore measured their output in the fundamental particles of life, bits, bytes, and bots. Um, and some of the things that they list on, on their list for, the, for this year include that these students have always enjoyed school and summer camp memories with a digital yearbook. It's not something that they've printed, it's, it's all been online. So when you think about Facebook, you think about Instagram, those are, their, those are where their memories are. They've grown up with MP3s and iPods and they never listened to the music on the car radio. And really they have no use for radio at all. Um, I know when I get in the car I throw in my iPod and, and that's about it. I do listen to NPR, but uh, you know, a lot like 2016, um, no, no place for radio ads. And they prefer to watch television everywhere except on a television, which I, I really I really like that one. Um, and then lastly, Robert De Niro is thought of as Greg Fokker's long-suffering father-in-law, not as Vito Corleone or Jimmy Conway. This one hurts. This, this one hurts a little bit. Um, you got to love Robert De Niro as Jimmy Conway. But anyway, that gives you a, a, a little bit of a, a sense of where students are coming from. And so... When we think about uh, when we think about these things, and we think about Beloit, and we think about kids, it's really important that uh, students are, mo are faculty, staff, teachers, and schools are modeling how to use this, how to use these tools well. Um, and certainly, by creating blogs and getting students involved and getting students to write, they're they're participating in using the social web in a way that's that's fruitful, um, has impact, and and is positive. Um, because going back to that Clay Shirky, um, those Clay Shirky slides, kids don't have that context of what the media was like um, 10 years ago. They, they've been born into it. And, and sharing everything online uh, is, is just sort of their MO. So it's important for us to be models. And I'll just move through. Thank you for uh, humoring me, Maddie. And next slide, here we go. So the blog, our first student and faculty blog we, we launched in 2007. Uh, to date, we've had about uh, 
over a hundred thousand views, and we average about a, a thousand views a week. And that sounds uh, that might sound a little impressive in terms of sheer numbers, but those aren't necessarily numbers to look at. But just to give a sense of sort of high level volume of, of viewership, um, that's what's generated over the last six years. We start out with faculty and students. Um, we started posting five days a week. Each student and faculty member would have their particular day, but it's grown where we had to go into the weekend and kids didn't seem to mind, so that was awesome. And we post seven days a week now. Um, our audience is current, our current families. Uh, our current families read the blog. We, uh, every Thursday we send out an email um, and families uh, can get to the blog through that email. Faculty and students read it. Uh, alumni certainly read it. Uh, prospective families we know read it. And there's a lot of uh, analytics to show that many people around the world will stumble upon the blog uh, via search. So when, you, when you're thinking about starting a, a, a blog, and um, a student faculty blog, it's important to think about audience. But um, a lot of things that our students are writing about their day-to-day -day lives and faculty, their day-to-day -day lives and, and what life is like at our private boarding school, um, that can have a lot of impact on current families who would like to keep, keep tabs of, of what's happening at the school. It's also a great window for prospective families into the day-to-day -day life of the school. Um, I'll get into a little bit of some of the things uh, I learned, but um, one of the things that we do here is, is uh, we, I don't oversee their content. Um, we have a little bit of a process. They write writing samples uh, right around now. Uh, if they want to be a blogger for next year, I look through the writing samples and then over the summer uh, make a decision, and then after that, they are in charge of their own content. I, I don't review it or, or really edit it. Um, I let them ponder it, think about it, write it, and when they hit publish, um, sort of the onus is on them. Uh, so it's a great it's a great way for them to understand the responsibility of publishing things online, and they really rise to the challenge. And I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that you get with a student run blog that um, that you really allow them to run with is you get pretty incredible content. And when it comes to blogging and content marketing, content really is the the king and the queen. Um, you want you want students to uh, you want students to write authentically and, and, and with their own voice. So it's it's 100% uh, uh, the real deal. It's their it's their thing. And when you do that, you get something like what Abby uh, Turner wrote uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Abby is a, a ski patrol or was a ski patroller here at Cool uh, before she graduated. Um, and she came to me in Jan January before the year she started blogging, saying, "I really want to be a blogger. Can I be a blogger?" And I uh, said, absolutely, you know, there'll be a process, but uh, I like your chutzpah. So <clears throat> she, uh, one day, uh, she was writing about Ski Patrol at, at Gould, which is a unique program for us. Um, and if you read the post, and there's a link below, uh, she was sort of feeling it out as she wrote. She thought about, uh, um, you know, I really want to think about, write about Ski Patrol, but it was really this pack. Um, and this pack belonged to... Uh, an alum from two, th I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrong here, 2001, I believe. Um, and he was a gentleman who was on the ski patrol and uh, who had a, a horrible accident and ended up uh, passing away on the mountain. Um, and what what Abby received is, is she received uh, uh, his pack. Um, every year a ski patroller will, will get, uh, uh, his name was Brad Cunningham, Brad Cunningham's uh, ski patrol backpack to wear for the rest of the time they're in ski patrol and it's a tremendous honor. It's one of these things that was happening. Um, I had no idea was happening when I read this blog. It was it was quite moving. So a couple of quotes out of out of her post is he uh, he who was it was probably our um, uh, one of our directors of the ski patrol pro program told me that the pack belonged to a ski patroller who died in an accident on the mountain. I was allowed to use it for the rest of my two years in the program, and I was immediately humbled. And she goes on to talk about what it really meant to her to, to have that pack and what Ski Patrol really meant to her. Uh, and it was a very, very powerful post. And you can see the power of that post in the, in the amount of engagement that our, our community, our greater school community, had with the post in, in writing back to Abby. Um, since she posted, it's had nearly 2,000 views. <clears throat> excuse me, and, and in the last few months, uh, in the last month, it's had 13 views because posts continue to live on the, on the web. 
Um, but it was really the comments that were that were absolutely incredible and really uh, where the blog became sort of this communal spot where people started to share memories of Brad. Um, we had a former head of school who, who wrote in that he was very glad that Brad had touched the, the uh, had touched Abby's life through Ski Patrol and thought that her, her insights were very moving and um, and that they caught him off, uh, he, he and his wife, by surprise. So you can tell, you know, that there was some emotion there. Um, and a lot, many alumni uh, chimed in, um, expressing their thanks to Abby for, for sharing that and bringing back memories of Brad. And we had a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a past parent and a, a member of our board of trustees who also thanked uh, Abby for her story. So there was this tremendous outpour of appreciation and emotion and engagement with Abby and with the story that, that spanned um, years at Gould through through the, our alumni base and through trustees and, and former um, uh, former heads of school, and, as well as current faculty, current students, um, and it got shared. Uh, it got shared out a lot uh, via the web. Fifty-seven likes on Facebook, uh, a number of tweets. So th I think that's a really strong example of uh, uh, content, and and really. Getting out of the way and let, letting the students write, I, I find, is, has worked for us in terms of generating, you know, what that that amazing content that that resonates with folks because it's it's really about the kids and the kids and the and the teachers are sharing their their experiences here. <clears throat> so what we've learned the, the first year, uh, we didn't throw it out there to anyone. Come forward if you'd like to write. We really we we picked and we chose uh, folks who we thought were going to. Um, sort of fit the different niches that we wanted to promote at the school. Um, and what we found is that um, it, it worked, but it did not work as well as when students who were interested in writing and wanted to come forward and write, um, those were the ones who would write on a continued basis um, and write well and write from their arts and also <clears throat> um, write consistently. Um, so the best bloggers are those who want to blog and um, we learn not to choose bloggers based on their interests. We also started by giving them a stipend um, every every semester, but then realized that uh, we we learned that that students weren't doing it for the money, um, and so we thought, well, let's give them the tools so they can be better at blogging. So every every uh, new blogger gets a little Kodak uh, video camera, and I give that to them and say, go forth, blog, take video, take pics. And um, this is yours. Thanks for thanks for doing this. This is your gift. Um, we let them find their voices again. There's there's really no editing. Uh, if there's some real grammatical stuff, I'll go in and, and clean it up a little bit. But again, the process is sort of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, work that out so we know what what students are uh, are coming forward who would like to blog, and we get out of their way and let them write their stories. And in the case of Abby, that's that's a great thing to do. Um, and then lastly, we learned that people really like blogs and people like the content in blogs and blogs drive a lot of traffic to the website. Um, and I think this is, learning this, we decided that um, we should really move forward with a, a sort of a brand ambassador program. And so since the blog, um, who are our first brand ambassadors, meaning they're telling the story of Gould and they're really shedding light on the Gould brand, and <clears throat> we're in a, a good spot at Gould where people really know the school. Um, they speak eloquently about the school. They understand the school, um, and they can really sort of become these ambassadors for the brand of our school because they're they're living it and they're talking about it and they're sharing it. So since the blog, we've started to create more and more blogs for folks. <clears throat> as folks have come forward and, and requested them. And we really work hard to work with the different people, different people on campus who would like a blog. Um, talk, we, I, I, we sit down, talk with them, go through sort of the ins and outs, what makes a good blog post, um, things to think about, and then we work to create it. And they all live on our uh, WordPress website, so they're pretty easy for us to create on campus. And so we're up to about a little over a dozen blogs now, and these are a, a smattering of, of different blogs from admissions to our snowboarding program to uh, Gould Academy Life, which is the communications blog, um, our, our library, skate school, freestyle, our Nordic program, 
and Ruby in the Rough, our head of school, has a blog. And so we really try to create this culture of content creation uh, where folks are, are talking about what they do at the school to give our school some life on the, on the web. <clears throat> so getting back to that statement of people like blogs and, and, and blogs drive web traffic, these are some statistics from our, our analytics uh, showing some data from September 1st through uh, December 31st uh, of last year. Um, and of the top 10 web pages viewed over that time, <clears throat> three of those three of those uh, pages were social web or blog content. So as you'll see the number four circle, that's news and blogs. That's a, a page on our website um, that's really a mashup and, and pulls in is a feed of all of our blogs, our, some of our Facebook pages, uh, Twitter, Twitter accounts. Um, and that's pulling people into our website. Uh, number seven is our blog. Um, the, the Gould Academy blog, and then uh, number 10 is our, our Nordic blog. Um, our, our new uh, Nordic coach has really taken hold of the reins and, and is doing a great job with, with his Nordic blog. And so when you look at that, you think, wow, that's, people like that content. When people go to our website, they like the about page, they like admissions, um, but then they're going to the news and blog section. <clears throat> they like athletics, they like academics, but they also like our Gould Academy blog, they like the Nordic blog. Um, they like, they, they're traveling, they're finding that stuff when they're coming onto our website. But what I think is also very important uh, and, and very interesting and, and something that we've really keyed in on are the entrance pages. Um, so the, the, the top 10 web pages viewed, those are folks who are coming into those pages on the web, but those are also people finding their way to those pages when they're already on our web our website. The entrance pages are those pages that are actually bringing people through search onto our website. And this is where a blog can have a lot of uh, impact on that. So the top three entrance pages where people are actually, they're not coming to googleacademy.org, they're coming into our website via the blog, uh, they're via the news and blogs page and um, via the Nordic page. Um, our homepage will always get a lot of that um, but it was interesting when I ran the numbers um, of the top four, three of them were uh, were the, this, these blog, these blog, this blog content and this social web content. So people really like the content, and it's how people will find your website. So to, to tear the roof off a little bit of that even more, I wanted to key in on our Nordic blog. And I think this is a great example of, of why um, it's important and makes a lot of sense. It can also, <clears throat> excuse me, take a little of the, the pressure and the heat off the communications department a little bit, who's really in charge of telling all of these stories, and there's only so many hours of the day, and, and, and there are so many stories to be told at your, on your campuses. Um, so for folks who would like to tell their own stories, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to allow them to. Again, it's marketing. It's professional development and it's modeling. Um, so our 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 new um, Nordic coach Nick Klein uh, came on board this year and he and uh, was doing this a lot at his former organization that he was he was running or working with in, in the Nordic industry. He was really excited about starting the blog, so we got together. And we were talking about it, <clears throat> and he's really run with it. Um, so since September, when he first launched. This. His blog has become the 10th most viewed page on our website, um, September through December 31st. Um, he continuously posts, um, and he continuously posts really in a very journal style. Uh, so for current families who are in our Nordic program, they can go on and they can just see what their kids are doing day to day. Um, and for no other reason to start a blog, uh, for no other reason to start a blog, it's, it's a great tool for current families. Um, and then growing it from there to see what happens with search and using it as, as a marketing tool, um, is, I think is the, is the natural movement of it, but for no other reason to get started, it's a great way for, for your current families to see what's going on at the school. Um, and they've really, and, and from the comments, you know, a parent has said, you know, thank you, you're doing a great job with the team and I love the blog. Um, an industry, Nordic industry peer says you're doing a great job, you know, I'm not surprised. You know that's that's some nice uh, 
um, branding right there uh, and sort of uh, thought leadership for Nick um, out there in, in, on the web. But it's because, going back, the blog has become the 10th most viewed page on the website. People really enjoy the content that he's posting. It's rich with videos, it's rich with photos, and it really tells the story of what the team's doing. Um, and as a result, it's become the, the fourth um, uh, most popular uh, entrance page onto the website. Um, and part of the reason of that, of that is because uh, a, a website called fasterskier.com, which is if you're in the Nordic industry, and you can think about this in terms of the, your own niche that you might have at your school, um, and, and here at Google, our, our com, uh, competitive skiing programs are, are pretty popular and are real differentiator for us, so you know we're pretty excited about this. Um, but you can think about it, what those differentiators are at your school and how this might um, uh, parallel with that, with your with your niches. Um, FasterSkier.com is really sort of the industry standard in terms of media out there that's covering Nordic skiing. So if you're in the Nordic industry, this is where you go to find information. This is where you go to see what's happening in the industry. It's This is sort of the go-to place. As a result of, of his blog, he and his uh, assistant coach reached out to Faster Skier and said, hey, we've got this blog. You know, we'd love it if you pick it up and put it on your website. And as a result of that, Faster Skier has a blog role where they're consistently pushing out um, other industry blogs. And the Gould Nordic blog is, is one of those. Um, and so the Nordic, the, 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 uh, um, the, the referrals, the, the folks that are coming into our website, we can see a considerable spike are coming directly from fasterskier.com. So those are folks heavily entrenched in the Nordic industry uh, coming into Gould Academy because they're learning about it from fasterskier.com, which is, which is the sort of uh, pinnacle of the Nordic industry in terms of, of media. So from a public relations standpoint, this is a real, this is obviously a real win. Um, it's like having, it's like, it's like pitching your, uh, if you're a band and you're in Rolling Stone and suddenly everyone's coming to your website because they learned about you from Rolling Stone, that's a, that's a pretty exciting thing. Um, and it, it, it's sort of the equivalent of that. So from a public relations standpoint, this is great PR. Um, and from a marketing aspect, it's great marketing because they're coming into our website and if they're a prospective family, they can move into the admissions funnel from there. And the content that he posted, again, appeals to multiple, multiple constituencies. Um, being, having refers come from Faster Skier and Faster Skier making the decision to pick up our blog, uh, that strengthens the Gould Academy brand and especially the Gould Academy uh, competition program, Nordic program brand, <clears throat> while also uh, boosting Nick as sort of a thought leader in his industry, which is, again, that professional development piece. Um, so if you're thinking about pulling the roof off and, and allowing folks on your campuses to start uh, blogging, I think this is, a, this is a great example to be able to, to show people. Um, as a result, in, in moving down sort of a natural progression, um, and getting back to that search piece, blogs are a great way to get in front of your particular audience. And a lot of it has to do with search. And blogs are a wonderful way of, of getting out in front um, in, the, in, in Google search. I, I don't want to go into a whole lot of search engine optimization specifics, but the fact that blogs are constantly changing, um, the content is always fresh, people can comment, which keeps it fresh. Um, your titles and the way that you title your blog posts, um, the way that you can title tag your blog posts, which is the little line up above your, your browser that pops up when you go to a website. All of these impact how Google will find and archive your information. Um, so a couple examples, we had uh, uh, another, another Nordic story, a girl who, uh, who was on the Nordic Junior National Team a couple years ago for Gould uh, named Molly Siegel. She was named to the team, thought, wow, this is a great opportunity. Congratulate Molly, shed a little light on her accomplishment, um, and let's see if we can get Gould sort of up in the rankings a little bit uh, when people will um, search Nordic Junior Nationals. Uh, so I, I threw together a quick blog post on our Gould Academy Life blog, the communications blog, 
um, and uh, made sure I had Nordic Junior National team in there in the title. And now when you search Nordic Junior Nationals 2012, it's the number one ranking um, uh, link on Google. Um, as I mentioned in case Nace, David Meerman Scott, I believe, refers to this as newsjacking, which is taking an, uh, an event that's happening and uh, making sure that you're writing about it so you can sort of uh, jump in there. Um, it, it, it's, it, it could be newsjacking, it also is just sort of always been public relations. When, you, when an event comes up and um, there's an opportunity to pitch your story and get it into the media, you do that, except now you don't have to pitch it to the media, you can write it in a way and, and pitch it to Google and, and really work to try to get, get out in front. Um, down below we had a freestyle skier um, uh, who was skiing at a local event called the Dumont Cup, Cup at Sunday River ski resort up here in Bethel, and uh, there was some chitter chatter of whether or not he was going to wind up on NBC uh, coverage of the Dumont Cup, which is a fairly significant deal in the freestyle world. And so I went, no one really knew, um, but I thought I'd make a nice uh, blog post to try to rank for uh, Dumont Cup, which is, a, a, again, a big deal in the freestyle industry. So I wrote a quick post about the student and asked the question, you know, is he Will he will he be featured in the in NBC Duma coverage tonight? And uh, yeah, I think he, he ended up being covered sort of late in the evening. The, the coverage didn't start until 1 a.m. Um, but it was a nice way to to take an event that was happening and and try to rank in terms of search for uh, uh, a search term that that gets a lot of traffic that uh, can again strengthen the brand of the school by being associated with um, a high level. Um, uh, freestyle event as well as a high-level uh, Nordic event. Um, so again, you can think about the different things that are happening at your school, the, the different niches that um, um, that really differentiate your school. How can you write about those things um, to make sure that people are, uh, when they search these things, they're finding you and your name and, and associating your brand with these things to, to, to build some real brand equity. Um, that's another way of, of, of using uh, uh, blogs, and and increasingly it will become increasingly more so for us, and uh, a lot of a, a lot of organizations are using it this way. Um, and moving on to that, getting in front of your audience, uh, the next steps for Google, based on uh, the last six years, uh, we 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 started the blog, um, and have had great success with that, in terms of making sure that folks really have a keen understanding of what Google's all about. And with that blog, we really focused on the content and wanted to make sure that it felt sincere, felt, you know, all the, all the words that we're using now, authentic. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to make sure that, that people really understood our school and our brand and what we're all about. From that, we learned um, people really like that content. Um, that's how folks really understand our school. They, they, that's how they really learn about our school. We do have a web we obviously have a website and they can get a lot more information through the website. Um, that's very important as they're make, going through their decision uh, making process if they're a prospective family. Um, but blogs aren't boilerplate. They're the living, breathing uh, entities and stories of your school. They're real people talking about their experiences and, and people really gravitate and, and want that. Um, people love stories. From that we decided, wow, this is really working well. Um, we should really try to figure out a way that more and more people can have the opportunity to blog for Google. Um, again, uh, to shed light on the school, but also for their own professional development and the model for students, um, while simultaneously <clears throat> bringing in traffic to our website to learn about Google. Um, and so therefore, for the last uh, number of couple of years, um, this brand ambassador program has really taken off and, and more and more people are, are are writing about their experiences here. So now that that culture has been built, we just went through a, a, a work. We just worked with a consultant, a, a search engine optimization consultant, uh, to look at our website, to look at all the content that we're creating, um, and to look at our blogs, and to do a technical audit of our website to make sure it's functioning in the right way, where uh, you know Google, all all the sort of uh, uh, technological techie SEO stuff that that uh, I'm not necessarily great at, um, but is really important. Um, 
he's come back with some findings on how to how to really make sure our website and our blogs are are firing in all cylinders so that Google's uh, finding it in the way that it should. He's also given us a ton of keyword research, so now we can create a real uh, content marketing strategy <clears throat> and a real uh, uh, content um, calendar where folks are writing about things that. Uh, are writing about their experiences and writing about the, the programs that they love at the school in a way that they'll get in front of folks who are looking for those experiences and those programs. So what we're trying to do is if you look to the right you'll see this sort of upside down octopus is we really want to break, uh, we really want to expand those entrance pages. So instead of a, f a family searching for Gould Academy it's a family that's searching for something that we offer, but they don't know that we exist. Um, but we want them to find us because we want them to, when they're looking for Nordic skiing or um, design thinking or whatever these things are that, that we're good at, um, we want them to find us and we want them to come into our website based on their interest and not the homepage. Uh, so really we flip the website upside down. Um, and folks on the web who maybe aren't aware of us but are looking for something that we offer are going to find it through these authentic content rich experiences through blog posts um, which we know they which we know folks like um, and in that way they come into our website and they can learn more about Google Academy so we've, we've worked on a number of uh, a lot of keyword research so some of the things that we can write about now um, are based on clear research and clear data that folks are looking for this, but they may not be finding it. Um, and we want to make sure that they're finding these things and, and uh, we're providing the content that they're looking for to bring them into the website to learn more about our school. Um, which brings us down to uh, content and blogging. And, and it's a real uh, content marketing push that we're working on right now. Um, and uh, uh, this, this consultant also gave us a number of uh, content ideas, uh, a number of a number of posts for each blog that we have that will help us move forward with that. Um, and then all of this, of course, will be rooted <clears throat> or come back down to our Google Analytics, where we can then look and see, okay, we're writing about these these topics. Um, now let's let's make sure that uh, we're we're successfully measuring um, how these topics are are doing for us and how they're working for us. So we can make sure that um, uh, we're, we're writing and, and, uh, and creating content in the best way possible um, that matters. So when people come onto our site and they're interested in our school, they'll hit the uh, they'll click the big shiny yellow button that says "Please request more information." Um, so from it, from the, the the admission side of things, um, that's where we're really pushing uh, with some some content marketing. Maddie, how am I doing for time? Um, we are a little, we're going a little over. So just whenever you get a chance to wrap up, there's a ton of questions in the queue. So I, um, I'm happy to go at those whenever you're ready. I think if I hit the next slide, I'm done. Perfect so. timing. <laughs> well, great. So um, people are really into the whole process that you have going. I think um, there's a lot of uh, a brain spinning right now. So one of the um, first questions that come up, I think that'll segue kind of into our Q&A section here is, um, you mentioned that the, the blog now has posting for seven days, um, seven days a week. And then what about like these other um, micro blogs, so to speak? How often are they posting and or what would you suggest? Um, the, the, the blog really lends itself to the seven day a week platform because that's just how we created it. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great way to it's a great way to break it up so that not one person is responsible for, for creating content all the time. Yeah. Um, that was sort of what we had in mind going into it. So one student was blogging just once a week. Um, so we had someone, you know, Monday's their day, Tuesday's the other student's day, Wednesday's that faculty member's day. And then really it cuts down on the amount of time that they're spending um, creating this stuff. Um, <clears throat> that's really worked out well because it does take a little bit of the pressure off. It really, um, for, for other folks who are part of that sort of model, um, it's really up to them. And, but there's, but I say that with a grain of salt in terms of this stuff works as, just as well as, as the amount of time and effort that 
is put into it. Um, so if you're blogging a ton, um, and by a ton I mean maybe a post a week, maybe two posts a week, um, th that's wonderful. And if you if you're blogging that much, <clears throat> chances are you're going to see more engagement, more visits as a result of that versus you only blog maybe once a month. Um, I don't. I think it really depends on. It, it all comes down to having a conversation with the person who's interested, um, and it all comes down to the idea that these are just. These are tools. These aren't the strategy. Um, I have a lot of conversation with folks who say, you know, I want to blog because I want to do this or that, um, and we'll, and maybe the conversation then shifts to, you know, I'm not sure the blog is the best platform for that. Maybe what you would like to do is a. Um, a Facebook page so, so people can follow your team. Um, but it sounds like you're really interested in, in posting photos and not really writing a whole lot, so that might be a better avenue. Um, so I think it's important to have that conversation first and then decide, okay, well, what's the goal and then what's the best tool or medium to reach that goal? Yeah. Um, but with the blog, it, it really comes down to the conversation of, it, it comes down to consistency. I, I don't think it's a bad thing at all to post once every two weeks. But when that second week comes around, it's important for that post to be live so people get used to it. And I think people should, should ease into it. It, it, it. it doesn't make a lot of sense to say you have to now post three times a week. And uh, that's, that's a lot of pressure. Um, and, and we don't typically... Um, do the hard sell on this. Uh, it's really, it's really sort of evolved over time. Where now folks are are approaching the communications office, saying, "Gee, I'd really like to to work with you and to create something here because I see other people do it, and I'm really intrigued and interested in it." Um, or if it's if there's a, a program on campus that we think, you know, this could be really great, and or gee, this person this person could be a really good blogger. They're just creative and they're good writers and. They just have the personality for it. You know, we'll approach them and talk a little bit about it. But it's never a it's never a hard sell of you have to do this. Um, we learned through the gloggers that 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 doesn't work. It's the ones who really want to do it that that make it sing. Yeah. When do you think um, that shifted towards your? You know, the culture seems like it's what you started blogging in two thousand seven. And yes. then how long, like, do you think it was two years ago that kind of everyone was grasping the idea and really wanted to participate in it? Basically, where I'm getting is, you know, like, how long did it really take to get this culture of sharing and blogging going? Yeah, it probably in the last two, two and a half years, I'd say it's really started to, <clears throat> excuse me, take off. Um, it's... We started out as, as sort of a, if we build it, they will come. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's really taken that amount of time. I think, I think it, we could have sped it up a little bit more. Um, we really sort of felt it out for a while just to see, um, in, a, in a lot, just to see, just to see how it would, how it would evolve. Um, but a lot of it really, a lot of the reasoning came because of what we were seeing with the Glock. I mean, that really, that really sort of was the impetus for our foray into social media as a whole. Um, we started the blog within a month or two um, that I came on board, and then immediately launched a YouTube presence and a Facebook page, and felt really great that we had those things, even though there was nothing on them. Um, but uh, quickly learn that that's just not how you do it, mm -hmm. and 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 move quickly to to move away from that strategy. Um, but really, the blog and and watching it and watching people interact with it slowly but surely, um, that's what that's what got us thinking about making sure that other folks were ha had the opportunity to to have access to these tools through the school. Anyone can start this stuff on their own, um, but we wanted to make sure that if folks wanted to do it. Uh, because of of sort of their passion and excitement for their programs, we wanted to make sure that we were we were helping in any way we we could. Um, and so we talked about it. We started talking about it more and more. Um, uh, I and and um, or me me and uh, our admissions director would talk about it at faculty meetings um, on occasion. 
and give updates uh, as what we were seeing with the blog. We, we would just get it out in front of people internally in different ways. Um, and I think that that's important to do. Um, I would talk about blogging and social web in front of the students at morning assembly um, on sort of a modeling, you know, being good social citizens kind of spiel. Um, but that's just another way to sort of talk about, you know, uh, what I do and, and, and also uh, sort of the, the power and, and the possibility with these tools. So when we started seeing how it was working well with the blog, we started talking a little bit about it more and more. And then a couple of people who we knew were really interested in blogging and, and would be early adopters, we got going. And as that started to happen, more and more people start to take notice um, and, and start, to get, start to get interested. Great. Um, do you use a WordPress multi-site or what kind of platform are you working with? We do use a, a, a multi-site. Um, and I, I know what that means partially. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our, we, we did a web redesign uh, a couple of years ago and, and um, moved all of the content from, from a previous site onto the WordPress platform. Um, and we can create... Uh, we create blogs right right out of that, and I'm pretty sure it is a multi-site design. Um, I, I'll go up on my browser and, and click all sites, and down comes a list of all the different blogs. And um, as a result, so it's it becomes very quick. Um, I know that probably folks aren't, aren't necessarily on WordPress. They they have their other uh, content management systems um, that may or may not support a blog. But um, if they don't, WordPress is a, is a, it's still a great way. Um, it's still a great way to uh, to get the ball rolling, and you can, and, and it's a great way to to create buzz and drive traffic back to your site, even if it's not necessarily associated with your site um, or or built into your site. That that shouldn't um, that shouldn't stop anyone who's interested. Uh, but certainly, if it's possible to have it have the blog, I think in, embedded into your site, that's great because then when they get onto the blog post, they're already they're already there and they can move around pretty quickly from there. Yeah, great. Um, <clears throat> so you, as a communications person, are actually blogging less per se because you've empowered your community and you're asking them to create more content. Um, so what are you doing if you're not creating content, um, in terms of your role as a director of communications? Um, it's, I'm still, I'm still creating content, um, but not yet, not necessarily on the blog. Although I did post today and I felt very proud of myself for doing it. <laughs> um, what it's become is a little bit of a content curation role and, this is not my, and this is just a, a small piece of, of sort of my, my role at Google. I work a lot with the development office. Um, I work with admissions in terms of direct mails, um, creating uh, uh, online advertising and landing pages to our school magazine, to sort of the PR spokesperson for the school, and I'm on the, the senior administrative staff. So it, it, it like everyone else, it, it, there are many hats to be worn. Um, so I'd love to say that this does free up a ton of time for me, but not not necessarily. But I think it's I just think it's exceptionally important to be able to do. Yeah. Um, but what it does do is is it's a it's a great question because we what we have noticed is that we'll get scooped. Um, our office will get scooped by by a student on Monday um, who will write about some, you know our winter carnival or, or some event that's happened on campus, um, and we'll be thinking you know. In years past, we would have sort of covered that, written a post about what Winter Carnival is like at Gould Academy, had photos, had video, but we are getting scooped by kids, um, which is kind of neat. And it's not only neat, but it's also, um, you know, I, I, I can write about those things and try to do it in a way that doesn't sound like the Google Communications office, but at the end of the day, it's written by the director of communications versus a story that's written by um, Alec Manning, who's one of our gloggers and is a junior. Um, and when that, when that, when the author is that student, I think it, I think it has a little bit more power um, than than my title, certainly. Um, and so, 
it's been fun because what happens is now you can sort of pour over a lot of different content um, because it's there's a lot being generated and then so you're not always creating your blog post and then tweeting out that post and then putting it on Facebook and getting it out this way or that way but you actually have a lot of different things to choose from um, so we're never really at a loss of pushing things out via other social channels like Facebook or Twitter because there's always a post mm. um, or there's always someone sharing a video or a photo so it's become a little bit more of a content curating role versus publishing role um, but what I've noticed though too is that uh, at the same time uh, I'm spending a lot more time working with people to, to help work with them on their blogs um, that's actually taking up more more time now um, yeah. which is something I'm, I'm kind of grappling with because it, it, it's a lot it's a fair amount of time yeah um, but again um, I think it's time very well spent especially when we look at what uh, the consultant got back to us with um, in making sure that so now I can I can sort of pitch a, a story idea become a little bit more of an editor and say you know people are looking for some tips on how to hit the curveball and um, you know this would make a great post for our, our head baseball coach who, who now who I'm working with right now to create a blog um, so if he's writing about these things that's going to boost Gould and it's going to boost him and, and that's a win for the communications department, I think. Awesome. All right. Well, I know that there are a lot more um, questions in the queue, so we will try to address these offline. So thanks so much for sticking around um, for the rest of the, the webinar and uh, the q and I just want to mention a few quick things before we head off. Um, we do have, this is like I mentioned at the beginning, this is one of a six-part series. So um, if you check our event page over at edsocialmedia.com, you can register for the other um, webinar series that's coming up. We also are going to be at NAIS next week. If any of you are around, we'd love to have you join us. We'll be hosting a tweet up um, Wednesday evening. So I know it's a little before the actual event, um, but it's at a pub right down the street from the conference center. Um, and that is also on our website under the events as well. So hopefully we'll see you all there. And more importantly, which is my big project in the next few weeks and the one I'm the most excited about is our summits coming up um, in the Boston area on April 2nd. Um, it's at the Walnut Hill School for the Arts and we are bringing some big heavy hitters um, to the stage there to talk about social media. Um, kind of beyond the scope of what we've heard very, very often in the conferences um, and bringing it down to the education level. So we're pretty excited about that. You can find out more information um, and or register over at edsocialmedia.com slash summit. And tickets are only 149 until the first 100 are sold. So um, sign up soon if you're thinking about doing it. So other than that, Tucker, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, we really appreciate our webinar sponsors, Admissions Quest and Proof as well for supporting the webinar series. And hopefully we'll see uh, many of you in two weeks from now for our next webinar. So thanks again, Tucker. And uh, we'll post this on the website as soon as I have it exported. Great. Thanks, Maddie. And, um... Just for folks, if they have questions, my, my email and my Twitter handle <clears throat> are on the last slide, and, and please feel free to, to give me a ring or, or, uh, or send me an email. I'm happy to, happy to help in any way I can. Sounds great. Thanks so much.